<laughs> so thank you all for coming today. I'm John Cabana from the Institute for Policy Studies, and welcome to the first of a series of brown bags here at IPS that are going to showcase work that we do here and work that we do with close allies. Uh, and today, we are really thrilled. Today's topic, which I'm sure is what drew you in, is how poetry, policy, and playwriting dance for change. Um, and it says, join IPS poets, playwrights, and other allied uh, artists in discussing the power of combining a social justice mission with artist activism. And I will just say that IPS from its very start, IPS was started 53 years ago by a incredible piano player, Mark Raskin, whose son just, in effect, became the congressperson from just across the border there in Maryland, and Dick Barnett, who was a virtuoso on the violin. But they also were both public scholars, and they, from the start, combined art and activism. And the person whose name is very associated with our history, you know, we had two colleagues who were assassinated in 1976 here in Washington by the Chilean secret police, the Chilean dictatorship. And one was a young woman, the less well-known, a young woman named Ronnie Carpen Moffat. And Ronnie had a project at IPS that was called the Music Carryout. And it, she got a storefront, worked with others to get a storefront and up in Adams Morgan, where there were instruments that people could come in and take for free and um, play with others and, and make music. And that was, that was a project of IPS. So from the start, we have felt this connection. Our board chair at IPS is a poet, Ethelbert Miller. And um, we are proud at um, lifting up the intersection between the political and policy work we do and art. So three people today are going to help lead us in this conversation. Um, one is Sarah Browning, who I just want to say for the last 10 years, really the, the centerpiece of our work, uh, combining arts and, and the work that we do at IPS, has been through first DC Poets Against the War, uh, and then Split This Rock, uh, which has emerged into the preeminent national poetry program, um, of, uh, poetry of provocation and witness, and we're, we're really proud to be a partner with them. And, and we get weekly poems, we get more than that. We get, we get a constant interaction of great people coming here uh, and creating. Uh, so we have Sarah Browning, we have, um, we're going to be joined virtually uh, by Anu Yadav, who is an uh, artist in residence with IPS, um, critically acclaimed actress, writer, theater-based educator dedicated to telling the stories of people pushed to the margins of public discourse. Uh, and then back in person, John Pepper, uh, fresh off of his ultimate frisbee shoulder dislocation, uh, who uh, is, has been at the center of our foreign policy work here at IPS, was, was one of the co-creators of our foreign policy and focus program here at IPS, and is also an incredible uh, writer in many different genres and a playwright. Um, so each of them are going to share, and then we'll have a, I think, plenty of time to dance for change uh, at the end. So again, thank you for coming. And please come again next Tuesday. We are, we'll be celebrating our partnership with the National Domestic Workers Alliance group that has organized nannies and caregivers all over the country. Uh, and, and then on the week, you can see all that on our website. So without further ado, Sarah. <coughs> Thank you, yeah. and thanks all for coming. Uh, it's great to be here with you on this nasty rainy day and be in our beautiful new space here with the Institute of Policy Studies. Special thanks to John and Netfa Freeman, <laughs> who um, orchestrates these events so beautifully. Um, we're going to start by um, writing a poem. <laughs> and uh, the way we're going to do that uh, is I'm going to hand out these little strips of paper, which now maybe we don't have enough, but we'll see. Um, and I'm going to read two lines from a poem and ask you over the next hour and a half to write your own two lines. You don't have to overthink it. <laughs> um, sometimes uh, what comes first, 
without that censorship um, is startling and interesting. And if it is, and even if it isn't, <laughs> whatever it is, you might think just the first thing that comes to you in hearing those words or in anything that stimulates you over the course of this conversation, uh, write them down. And I'm going to suggest a form. I have a little prompt from one of the poems to, to um, get you started. And then um, we will go around the room at the end and read our line. And that'll be our group poem for today. Um, and if you feel like handing it back, I'll put it together as a poem and get it up on Split This Rock's blog. How's that sound? And this was Nefa's idea. So. Yeah. Although I think he stole it from us. <laughs> um, so as John said, Split This Rock is has the mission of cultivating, teaching, and celebrating poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes personal and social change. Because change can only happen if it happens at all of those levels. And so poetry can help us transform ourselves and others by reaching us in our hearts and then move us to action. And that's, I'm going to talk uh, when I, after I've done this, about three model projects that Split This Rock has um, carried out over the last few years, kind of at this intersection of the imagination and social change. And in each case, um, trying to infuse movements with the transformative power of, of poetry. So the poem I'm going to give, so here, here are the slips of paper. And normally I always participate in whatever prompt I give, um, but since I'm going to be talking, I'm not going to. Uh, pen. Oh. Pens. <laughs> A fast bag of pens. <laughs> Um, are there enough slips of paper? <coughs> if not, oh, they're still going around. Great. So the lines that I'm going to read are from a poem called Say Yes by Andrea Gibson, who's a poet who featured at our festival in 2010. And she's great. Hi, Karen. Uh, Netfa has more strips of paper. Who needs them in that corner? Although these two lines rhyme, <laughs> please remember that you do not need to rhyme. What? I know. <laughs> I know, it's shocking. So this, of all the things I read today, this is the only thing that is going to rhyme. If you're writing letters to the prisoners, start tearing down the bars. If you're handing out flashlights in the dark, start handing out stars. If you're writing letters to the prisoners, start tearing down the bars. If you're handing out flashlights in the dark, start handing out stars. So you may write anything, but one possibility is to write, if you're dot, 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 fill in, start you're blanking, start blanking. Andrea Gibson. If you're writing letters to the prisoners, start tearing down the bars. If you're handing out flashlights in the dark, start handing out the stars. And I'll tell you why I chose this, aside from their beauty. Not that beauty isn't enough.
So this poem came to me today uh, as a possibility because we included it in a packet of poems that we were calling Poems of Love and Welcome that we put together for an action that we did during Splitless Rock Poetry Festival, which was two short weeks ago. It's every two years, it's the cornerstone program of Splitless Rock. And 600, 700 poets, activists, Poetry lovers converged on DC for four days of conversations, poetry readings, workshops, and this action, which was we have often in the past done um, at festivals actions on specific uh, pieces of legislation or social issues that more specifically defined. We did one on um, Citizens United at the Supreme Court that corporations are not people, money is not speech, poetry is speech, and everybody provided a line and we created a group poem that way. But this time we started feeling like in the climate um, that this election cycle finds us in, so filled with the rhetoric of fear, hatred, making of one another creatures to be feared and to be scorned. We felt that as poets, it was incredibly important for us to speak for welcome and for embrace. Whether that is uh, refugees, others who've been made to feel excluded from our own their own country, the United States, people of color, queer folks, people with disabilities, that poetry can um, build common community to be with them, can, can bring us together and remind us of what is human in each of us. And so we invited everyone who wanted to participate, and some IPSers came and participated, to bring a poem of love and welcome to read to passers-by. And we found out in the K Street neighborhood, uh, Farragut North and here in DuPont, kind of up and down, um, in groups of five or 10 on street corners and at metro stations and read poems to each other and to passers-by and handed out poems to passers-by. And of course, on the flip side of the poems, because we're organizers, was the list of readings for the festival that were free and open to the public. Uh, but in our program book, which uh, went to everyone who'd registered for the festival, um, and this is it. We wrote about how do you enact love and welcome in public policy uh, so that everyone would feel equipped if someone challenged them on the street to address these questions. And just quickly, stop deporting families back to Central America. And I, you all in this room don't need details on this, but we lay them out a little bit in each one. Welcome refugees, particularly of wars of our own making. And uh, we said that the U.S. had accepted only 15,000 Syrian refugees, but are committed to accepting. But I later learned that number was 10,000. 10,000. Uh, commit to the safety of black and brown people. End legal discrimination against LGBTQ people throughout the land. Uh, enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act. So there's the policy in place, but it's not enforced in the slightest or very, very selectively. And, you know, of course, the list could go on. Um, $15 an hour minimum wage is another act of, of welcome and love, so et cetera. Um, and always trying to, when we engage poets in social action, uh, making sure that the, the poetry is paired with what the policy recommendations are, and that's one great gift of being here at IPS, is always to have connection to the terrific public scholars here and recommendations from them. So, Andrea, uh, for folks who hadn't brought a poem, uh, we have this packet that they could read from. And Andrea's poem was one of them, and I'll just read, actually, it's just a longer excerpt from this very long poem, Say Yes. This is for the possibility that guides us, and for the possibilities still waiting to sing 
and spread their wings inside us. Because tonight, Saturn is on his knees, proposing with all of his 10,000 rings. That whatever song we've been singing, we sing even more. The world needs us right now more than it ever has before. Pull all your strings. Play every chord. If you're writing letters to the prisoners, start tearing down the bars. If you're handing out flashlights in the dark, start handing out the stars. And um, I'm happy to share this packet if anyone, but you can also go to, these are all drawn from Split This Rock's online database of poems called The Quarry, which is searchable by social issue. And I pulled them up by, by uh, checking the ones that were coded love and hope. Um, and some of them are also, of course, coded, uh, you know, racism, racial justice, or environmental justice. They might have specific thematic theme, uh, tags, but they also had love and hope. Um, so you can do that as well. So uh, the second, oh, and people had all kinds of experiences on the street. Most uh, bureaucrats and functionaries uh, on the streets of Washington, D.C., of course, race right past you. No, 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 no. Even when you say a poem, poem of love and welcome, <laughs> uh, it's quite astonishing having that experience. I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> um, but some stopped and said, what? A poem? Or they read it, or they took it, and you never know where that poem's going to go, and who's going to read it next, and where they'll leave it for someone else to read it or they'll share it with their friends. And we encourage everyone to share all the poems that are in the quarry. Um, anywhere, as long as you give attribution, of course, to the poet, and we hope also to speak this well. Uh, second thing, project uh, that, we, that I want to talk about was On Lutonabe Street Starts Here, DC 2016, which was January to March of this year, and a coalition of groups that came together to mark the anniversary of the bombing of On Lutonabe Street in Dagda. And on Lutonabe Street is the historic book selling street in Baghdad. It's where for centuries people gathered and could exchange unpopular ideas of uh, translated literature, the latest poetry, even when there was a repressive government. It was like a free space. And it was a center, a literary center for the whole Arab world. And in 2007, it was destroyed in a car bomb. 30 people were killed and many of the businesses were destroyed. And a bookseller here in the US named Bobo Soleil started this project of solidarity with the people of Iraq. And I'm just speaking out for the notion of and the hope for freedom of expression and that poetry, of course, being one of the most important ways that we can speak. And poets and writers and artists often being the very first that repressive governments target um, because they speak the hopes of the people. And so we brought 10 writers, translators, critics from the Arab world, uh, Arab America, and Muslim countries uh, to DC for this celebration. And I wanted to read what celebration, commemoration, solidarity, action. I wanted to read a poem by Mikha uh, Dunya Mikhail, who's an Iraqi poet who was here. Um, and Part of the question that, that we engaged ourselves and each other around was um, the fact of the Arabic language itself over the, since September 11th in particular, but even before, had become, has become to the American ear the sound of threat and violence because of how it's played in popular culture as well as uh, portrayed in the news. And, you know, that I was at a major Hollywood film and people were praying, praying, and the music was scary. The very sound of prayer has become equated with uh, fear. And so um, we wanted to make sure that the sound of Arabic was at every event, if possible, um, and also that we were bringing poets who write in Arabic with this incredibly rich and long literary tradition uh, to American audiences and to broader American audiences. Yeah. 25 years we've been at war with the people of Iraq, we dated from the first Gulf War. 
and yet we know so very little about their culture. So this poem is Dunya Mikhail. She's an Iraqi poet living in the United States now. In Iraq, after a thousand and one nights, someone will talk to someone else. Markets will open for regular customers. Small feet will, tick it, will tickle the giant feet of the tigress. Gulls will spread their wings and no one will fire at them. Women will walk the streets without looking back in fear. Men will give their real names without putting their lives at risk. Children will go to school and come home again. Chickens in the villages won't peck at human flesh on the grass. Disputes will take place without any explosives. A cloud will pass over cars heading to work as usual. A ham will wave to someone leaving or returning. The sunrise will be the same for those who wake and those who never will. And every moment, something ordinary will happen under the sun. <laughs> this was translated by Kareem James Abu Zaid. And a shout out to the translators who are helping to bring this work to us. And the third project, um, and of course, when we have conversation, I'm more than happy to answer questions and talk <laughs> more about any aspect of any of these. Um, the third project was a project to resist police brutality and, and demand racial justice. And it was in the winter of 2014-2015, even in the wake of the failure to indict the police officers over and over again who had murdered black and brown men and women. And we uh, decided to give a poetic platform to anyone who wanted to send us poems and create it. We have a blog, blog This Rock, uh, that we said, if you send us a poem that speaks against Racial uh, against police brutality and demands racial justice. Uh, we'll post it on the blog. So we called it a virtual open mic. And we ended up with 15 postings of seven or eight poems each. And uh, one of the ways that our database has been uh, compiled is that we publish a poem of the week. If you sign up for our listserv, you'll receive the poem of the week, or if you're on the IPS staff. So um, we, we choose from the ones that people submitted to the virtual open mic, we choose one uh, each week for that, um, I think it was a five or six week period that we featured these poems as poem of the week. And then at the end of the series, uh, we printed out all 165 poems or whatever it was <coughs> and invited people to gather with us at the Department of Justice and presented the poems to the Department of Justice along with uh, a letter that included the Ferguson action demands. And um, actually, oh yeah, the poem I've chosen from that is very short, but I want to read this sort of cover note that we had with each of these virtual open mics um, to give you a sense of the ways that we frame the role of poetry and um, bring it to action. So we called it, uh, so this was from one of the blog postings. And we have the same heading with each of the blog posts. And I had, we called the project, We Who Believe in Freedom Cannot Rest. I'm sure many of you know this uh, quote by Ella Baker that was turned into a song by Sweet Honey in the Rock. Until the killing of black men, so we had the epigraph from the quote, what the quote, until the killing of black men, black mothers, sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Ella Baker. Even as our hearts break in rage and anguish over the murder of black and brown people throughout the land by police who are not held accountable, here at Split This Rock we are heartened by the powerful actions in the streets and the visionary leadership of mostly young people of color in this growing movement for justice. We're also moved by the poets who continue to speak out, and especially by 
environmental movement that is ongoing um, and they just uh, did some powerful programming during the festival. Black poets speak out. In solidarity, Split the Swanic offers our blog as a virtual open mic, open to all who respond to our call for poems that resist this brutality and demand racial justice. The poems below were submitted in response to that call. Um, if you're moved by any of the poems below, please contact the Department of Justice and your local representatives to demand police accountability. Visit Ferguson Action Demands, of course, the link for more information. And this very short uh, poem, and then I'm going to pass it to Emily. And it's by a poet named J.P. Howard, who is uh, a known uh, of what this becomes, the mother of two young black men. Tonkas for the mamas and our sons. Trigger. Black boys walk. Off the street into our hearts. Before burial, her baby had that same spark. Same land, <coughs> a place to call home. Trigger, call mama before the burial ground becomes your new home. Beautiful black boys, beware. Walk home on a warm night. That's JP Howard. Thank you. <laughs> See, we're used to the TVs that the size of that. that it shines over everything. Uh, this is nice. Mm. Look, um, this is this is the pharmacy, not our class. So um, I tell you folks to bring in a real prescription, okay? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Okay, I'll, I'll just keep it here. The pharmacist turns around to unlock the medicine cabinet. Rows and rows and rows and rows of medicine. Enough medicine to help everyone. And she takes a bunch of the medicine and he puts it in a garbage. Wait, wait, wait. What are you, what are you doing? Just give it to me. No, it's expired. <laughs> well, it expires today, but no one's going to buy it. So. Can't you just give it to me? I mean, aren't you supposed to give people medicine? No, I don't give people medicine, okay? People pay for it. Everything costs money, and that could cost me my job. You know, what if someone got sick? So I wait. And I become invisible. And I watch the pharmacist take the trash outside. And 
and she throws it in the can, and then she leaves. I dig. And then I reach, I, I, I grab the pill. Here. If it expires today, then um, I still have today. I still have today. And then I hear the pharmacist's voice, hey, what are you doing? And that's when I start to run. <sighs> I'm running so fast, holding the medicine tight, tight, tight in my fist, my arms pumping. I'm running so fast that the earth starts to shake. I'm running so fast that the ground begins to crumble. I'm running so fast that smoke starts to rise and sparks start to fly. I'm running so fast that I take <laughs> flight. And my legs stretch out like God across the universe. <laughs> I'm running so fast that I am flying. And I can almost see the end of the universe. Spanish music is better than English. 
it's me up in your bed. No, no, I have to show you some um, English literature, you know, I'll, I'll bring you next time. But you know, you know, you know, what do you want? Uh, um, well, I'm, my parents are from India, but I was born in the U.S. And so say, what, what, what's your language? Uh, English. I mean, I used to know Hindi when I was little, but I, I, uh, I forgot it. You should know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll just read that book. <laughs> I, I said, uh, I think it's going okay. Um, I just got left with it. So I'm the latest, but the first one came from I'm the newest plays, Nina's Dream. Um, now we switch to John Pepper. So thank you. Um, those are both hard acts to follow. Um, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about epicenter. I'm going to talk about playwriting. I'm going to connect a little bit to what Bobby's work is as well, and then I'll finish with. Um, so Epicenter is something that Ethelbert Miller and I sat down and talked about. Ethelbert was very connected to, to IPS on the board, very connected to Split This Rock. And we wanted to come up with something inspired by Split This Rock. Uh -huh. And we wanted to, to think about how else we could kind of explore the intersection between art and activism. So we thought, well, we would look primarily at the Middle East, because the Middle East is issue that is really galvanizing public attention right now, and specifically Iran, because we have this great agreement, this nuclear agreement with Iran signed this summer, and how could we, can culture, ensure better relations between the United States and Iran? Because I don't know if you've been reading the paper, but both sides, both the United States and Iran, have insisted <laughs> that the agreement is just an agreement. You know, it's just going to focus on the nuclear issue. Forget about any other kind of rapprochement between the two countries. Because from Iran's point of view, the United States remains the great Satan. And from the United States' point of view, if you listen to Congress, Iran is still the worst possible country in the world. So given that general approach on both sides, how can we explore cultural ways of people-to-people -people contact culture to strengthen the relations between the two countries. So with Epicenter, we're doing two things. One thing is we're amplifying the work that's already being done in this area in Washington, D.C., some of which Sarah already talked about. So we've done a number of videos, short videos, of people who came here for the Al Mutanabi Street Project, fabulous people. So you can go to our website and you can hear Dunya Mikhail read her poem about how the Okinawa Street. In fact, you could go to the website and hear Sarah Browning read her poem about how Okinawa Street. You can go there and you can hear Michael Rakowitz, an artist who's done incredible work, talk about his project, reconstructing all of the art that was looted from the National Museum in Baghdad. This incredible project he's been doing for the last few years. Uh, we have videos coming up on Heartbeat, which is a musical cooperation between young people in Israel and young people in Palestine. And as well, coming up, uh, if you haven't been there yet, I highly encourage you to go. The new exhibition of photography by women in the Middle East at the National Museum of Women and the Arts, which has four uh, photographers from Iran. Fabulous work, absolutely fabulous work. So we have a video going to come up with the curator taking us through the exhibition. I wanted to share with you just a short five minute clip. Uh, this is uh, another one of our peers. And 
It's the Gallery Al Kutz, which is at the Jerusalem Fund. And their most recent exhibition, which is not presently up, so this is like basically the only place you can see what was at Gallery Al Kutz, um, is a photographer, uh, Amr Mouni, who's an Egyptian photographer, and he did flowers. And you think, well, flowers, what does flowers have to do well, with it? Anything other than beauty. <laughs> but what does it have to do with activism or politics? Well, first five minutes of this, I'm a little hang back my paint of the curator. Thanks. Welcome to the Jerusalem Fund Gallery of Clips and our latest exhibition, which is The Eye of the Blossom, photographs by Egyptian photographer Amon Meek. This time, we decided that we wanted to show a version of the Arab Spring that's very, very personal. This is the true spring for Arabs, in that these photographs were all taken by Amr in the gardens and public spaces in Cairo from friends and family to show how much Egyptians are coping with their circumstances in their really classic way of living their lives and doing the best they can with the circumstances they have and creating beauty despite the circumstances around them. So, my name is Amar Mouni. I'm a photographer and a so called an artist, a contemporary artist, a very expressionist in the sense that I was a mixed media and photographer. A photographer, of course, is a common denominator with all my work. I grew up in a house of artists. And actors and filmmakers on the amateur side and on the professional side. My grandmother was titled the Empress of Comedy in the Middle East, and uh, my Smiley uh, Munib, and my grandfather, Elton Munib, was kind of the Buster Keaton of the Middle East and uh, producing, directing, and acting in the first time of movies that my father discovered after his death later on in the attic of the house and he found the films. The camera and capturing the rooms and, and art have always been kind of the um, the focus of what I've been exposed to through the family, through my mother. I mean, when we walk into our house, and the couches got flowers, the curtains have flowers, the, uh, uh, the dining room uh, placemats have flowers, uh, you know, the plates have flowers. So, everybody, you know, I grew up and I grew up over a garden, of course, uh, in, in Egypt. Um, that was full of, of flowers in all different times of the year. The flower even plays a, a, a very important uh, role in our society. And when we had Mother's Day, what do we, what do, we do? Um, when we have uh, certain celebrations, so here in Washington, we celebrate the cherry blossoms. The flower is um, prosperity. It's uh, it has its own symbols. So ask yourself. What does a flower represent to you? When I, when I came to the United States and Vietnam was its was, had a flower generation for flower children, and then the flower became a symbol of flower power, which really was not a flower power, I'd never knew that, it was actually for peace. So the symbolism of flower, as I was growing up in the United States, had a different meaning to me, which was revolution, uprise against war. Uh, People speaking out. To me, for example, this is one of the flowers that I really, when I look at it, I look at the Times Square. You know, I look at the crowd, I look at everything. And it's, it's just the position the folks, um, you know, the folks that have spoken out in Egypt for the dignity, for the right, for human rights, for religion, for, for all the aspects of the real uprise. Um, I love it. The flower. Even, even until today, it's still being used as a symbol of peace, a symbol of prosperity, a symbol of uprising or revolution. There's another one, for example, that could be, you know, when you look at it, the center of the Hay Square, you didn't know that we saw during the revolution of Egypt of 2011 and 2013. The Hay Square was the focal point. Uh, we know uh, what happened with journalists and how we were limited to the access to those areas. So Consequently, it was from higher, higher point of view than the towns. So when you focus in on this, you get, you get the feel of revolution, 
uprise, um, people speaking out, women's cluster for, some, for, for a, a, a common purpose. And I was just happened to be there as well, too. So I went down there and shut some tears, just as the, the morning bloom on a flower. Egypt has reached a bomb in one way or another, uh, from what I have noticed. And now it's on the rise. So it is hope. Um, so we have about uh, two dozen videos that you can comment onto our site to see. And we'll be looking into the near future, and as I said, um, the second aspect of the work, which is kind of original programming on Iran. Hope to bring uh, an Iranian play to the DC area, a uh, performance, and some discussion of keeping people contact. So that's the epicenter side. Um, if Anu were here, perhaps she would talk about how theater and performance is different from writing on the page. Uh, when you write something on the page, you have it published, uh, foreign policy focus, for instance, or any of the other IPS websites, you don't really know how people are reacting to it. Maybe at the comments section, at the bottom, and those anyway <laughs> you don't have much I mean it's so rare that you would see someone on a subway reading something that you wrote and get some reaction but when you're performing they're right in front of you and you can see exactly people are either paying attention and falling asleep you get immediate reaction to what you're saying and doing and it's an extraordinary experience so Based on that kind of experience, I wanted to, in my own performance, in my own playwriting, I wanted to take that and twist it a little bit when it came to the issue of surveillance and interrogation. I thought, well, the thing about interrogation and surveillance is often when you talk to people, they'll be like, well, I don't like it. But it doesn't, I feel a little embarrassed saying this, but it doesn't. I have nothing to hide. I'm not going to get interrogated. I don't like it. But, you know, there are bad people out there. And, well, <clears throat> so I thought, well, that's true. I mean, you often don't feel that connected to this issue. But what if you created an environment in which the audience is implicated directly? But how do you get people to come to something like that? You want them to come to something where you say, I I'd like to invite you to be interrogated and surveilled. And you will not be interested. But if you promise them that there's going to be free food and free drink, that there will be door prizes, this is America, people will be like, yeah, I'll come to that. So I set up a situation inviting people to a play, offering them free food, free drinks, and door prizes. And when they got inside, I gave them a little ticket, and I said, this will be for your door prize later on in the evening. And I had some this little uh, device that was giving out a nice smell of apple pie. And I had <laughs> all these kind of trays that looked like they had food in them. So people, I think, were excited about getting what they were promised. But this is America. <laughs> you don't always get what is offered. <laughs> Bait and switch, by the way. This technique is used by the police department when they want to get people to actually pay the tickets that they've accumulated, thousands and thousands of dollars of tickets, or if they have run off and not paid or appeared in court they will send out a note to all these people on their list and say, if you come to this party, you have a chance to win a Porsche, you have a chance to win a vacation in the Caribbean. And all these people who have committed crimes come to this party thinking, I'm going to get this prize. And instead, they get handcuffed and taken to jail. So this is actually a technique that the police department uses quite frequently. So anyway, you have these people in the audience. And I am playing a character who takes tickets out of a bowl, 
presumably give door prizes, but it's not a door prize. It's inviting people on stage to be interrogated. So suddenly, what you thought was going to be a relatively nice evening of theater was going to be a direct interrogation. Now, of course, I discovered very quickly that people don't like coming up on stage. <laughs> so in the first performance, I'd be like, number 43. Number 63, no one, no one coming on stage. So I decided I would plant my friends in the audience. So the general audience doesn't know, of course, these are plants, but pull them out, bring them up, interrogate them. So that people in the audience fear that they will be next. I wanted them to actually have that experience of fear. And in addition, the person who I brought up on stage and a screen behind them scrolls all the information that we've taken from their credit card and their phone. This, of course, for this particular festival, I did have people's credit card information because when they bought a ticket, it was provided for them. So there was all this surveillance information that I already had. So I wanted people to feel the threat of being interrogated and have all their information available to me to be interrogated. I'll leave it at that. It was an interesting performance. <laughs> uh, we went off in several different directions. Um, I've done other theater pieces on kind of the role of pundits here in Washington, D.C., and so forth. But uh, the last project that I'll talk about, which I'm right in the middle of right now, is a piece of dystopian fiction that maybe you're familiar with, very popular among teenagers, apparently. Uh, so I wrote an article a couple months ago, looking back from 2050, at what had happened to the world from here until 2050. And as you might imagine, since it's a piece of dystopian reflection, it wasn't a pretty picture. The world basically falls apart. I said, what happens if Britain withdraws from the EU, and the EU falls apart. What happens if Ukraine falls apart? What happens if, you know, all of the kind of countries that we take to be solid, sovereign, indisputable nation states begin to unravel as a result of a variety of different factors, including climate change, as, you know, resources become scarcer and people become start to compete over these countries. Okay, so I wrote this, this thought piece. And the editor said to me, well, you know, this could make an interesting novel. <clears throat> it could be. But do people really want to read an entire novel about the world falling apart? And just that? I mean, because this essentially was a foreign policy piece. I mean, who wants to read a novel about that? Uh, but, but, and this is, I should emphasize, all about storytelling. For me, the connection between art and activism is about how you take the techniques of storytelling, which are essential to art, and basically bring them into activism. Um, so here we have this foreign policy piece. How could I take storytelling and transform it into something that would be of greater interest? But well, here we have the world falling apart. What if we have the character who's writing this from the perspective of 2050 write about his family falling apart? If in his effort to understand why the world collapsed between 2018 and 2050, what he really wants to know is why his family collapsed, why his wife left him, why his children no longer talk to him. And even more, let's take the footnote. The footnote is probably the most uninteresting, academic, unstorytelling life aspect of the work we did. The footnote. Why don't we take the footnote and we make that part of the storytelling as well? In other words, this fellow whose family is falling apart, who's writing this report about the world falling apart, what if? There's something he's not telling us. 
What if there's a secret that he's been concealing, but that the person who's annotating his report several years later knows all about this secret and reveals it very slowly in the footnotes? So you have two storylines the line through the text and then the line through the footnotes, which converge at the end in a dramatic fashion. <laughs> That will be called Splinterlands, and that will come out somewhere between September and November, hopefully before the election, since it's very much tied to the election. Um, and Epicenter is on the web at ips-dc.org backslash Epicenter. And uh, I hope we'll return in the fall with a new play that will be as daring and subversive. Thank you. Great. Well, so now, should we open this up, Sarah Browning? Uh, are you the, your our little pieces of paper? Do you uh, want these now, or do you uh, uh, have a for conversation? Folks who came first? late, everybody uh, wrote a couple lines of poetry, and we're gonna um, get started a bit, and we're gonna read a, a group of poem. Um, but uh, I think that's a nice thing to close with. Okay, okay. so let's just that. open it up for yeah. these three rich, we don't have a lot here to reach as much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, folks who came in late. Um, so along those lines, I'll also jump in with the first question. Can you quickly recap your presentation for the four of us? <laughs> 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 um, um, or at least introduce yourself to your organization. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sarah Browning. I'm the co-founder and the executive director of Split This Rock. We're happy to be housed here in DC and split, I mean here in IPS. And Split This Rock celebrates, teaches, and cultivates poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes social change. And we uh, integrate poetry into movements for social justice and integrate poets into movements for social and so I talked about three kind of model projects in which we did that. Um, I'm lucky to have two of my colleagues here, Tanisha Jones, who's the managing director, yeah. and Tiana Tretta, who's the administrative yeah. assistant. So we can find yeah. you on the IPS website? Uh, we have our own website, splitthisrock.org, and our brochures are here. Uh, we're also the home of the DC Youth Slam team and other vibrant youth programs. and. The Louder Than a Bomb Teen Poetry Slam Festival <coughs> is coming up this weekend and next weekend. Finals for that LTEP uh, celebration are next weekend, so there are flyers for that as well. And then the national and even international teen poetry competition uh, is coming to DC this summer. Brave New Voices, it travels around the country and it'll be here in July. So we have postcards for that too. And lots of ways, they need hundreds of people to be involved in that. And active judges and bout managers and all this stuff. So see one of us if you're interested. Great. My name? Sarah Brown. And uh, here, at the Costume Museum. Yes, this Saturday. Thank you, team. John Becker. So the poetry prompt was I'll have this continue the last four lines. You can read it, um, and it says if you're writing letters to the prisoners, start turning down bars. So if you're blank, start doing blank. Or you can write anything you want. <laughs> Great time. Yeah, let's jump right into the conversation. Go ahead. So, and maybe yeah. if you could say your name, then. I'm Val Hardy from Olivia Marks Lab and other stuff. Uh, I'm sitting here looking at this wall. You guys look very great, but I'm looking at the art and the way that you struck is very nice. From the visual art side, and I suspect that there will be some of that in it, but I've been trying to find this intersection between all of the arts and humanities form around our political and social change work. So I think this is really good. I'm hoping that uh, for the other programs I understand will be. And I'd like to you know think about that intersection because a lot of the visual arts kind of static classic stuff and so that uh, you know, trying to find ways to have that voice 
do want to bring in the future. So we just want to call as far as like these judges as an all the you know, feedback to the schools as, as a constituency that we ask and we need to find a practical way to have that engagement to build a social uh, because I gave the Reader's Digest version of the Elmington Lovey Street project, uh, I didn't get a chance to say that there was a huge visual <laughs> arts component to that project, which is uh, in addition to poetry that was gathered by uh, the project, um, there were calls to visual artists. And so um, broadsides, artists' books, and prints, almost 600 pieces of art have been created in um, this part of the project in response to the bombing of Elmwood Snowy Street and uh, really in solidarity with, with the Gold Iraq. And almost all of that was on exhibit with the 11 different sites during the during the two months, mid January to mid March. Um, and one thing I loved about that project was the conversation between poetry and visual art and obviously the social issues uh, involved. But yeah, I agree. When I look for uh, there's something about DC that we don't have the kinds of kind of at least I haven't found those kinds of uh, really vibrant visual arts collectives of activist artists that we have in other cities. So correct me, folks know of them, um, but because I'd love to partner more. The uh, Michael Rackowitz, who I mentioned, was also part of the Elmwood and Elmwood Street uh, event, and he had his exhibition on George Mason. He's done these extraordinary uh, projects that kind of straddle the various categories. So the project where he's reconstructing all the looted objects from, from the National Museum of Baghdad, well, that's you know kind of standard visual uh, visual art statues. But he's also done he did uh, Enemy Kitchen, which basically he had a food truck in Chicago serving Iraqi food. This was during the, the Iraq War. Just to put a face on the culture, we had all we had people, um, we had Iraq, Iraq War veterans as well as Iraqi emigres working together, preparing the food and talking to people. We had another uh, event up in New York in which we partnered with a, a five-star restaurant in New York, where they did this very high brow you know, uh, Iraqi meal, but they served it on plates. From Saddam Hussein's uh, collection that they got off eBay. I mean, it was unbelievable <laughs> that it had been available, you know, on eBay. And that suddenly was, you know, they knew that that was the publicity hook. They could, you know, serve as much food as they want, the papers wouldn't care. But Saddam Hussein's China suddenly was all over the papers. And because it was all over the papers, the Iraqi government suddenly said, hey, that's our patrimony. We want those dishes back. And that too became an important opportunity for them to talk about it. Of course, it gave them that. But it was an opportunity to say, well, we're giving these back, of course, but it's important to talk about the patrimony of uh, artwork. You know, you know, his, he loves to say, you know, we're reconstructing this stuff that's been looted, you know, that no longer exists, could have been broken, could be sold on the black market, don't know where it is. So these paper mache reconstructions are now going on exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum and at the British Museum, side by side with other art from the 19th century from Iraq that had been looted <laughs> at a different time. And so here the museums have to confront this issue of, well, what is looted art? You know, is it only looted when you know it happened 10 years ago? What about if it was taken in the 1880s? You know? So that's you know an interesting way of pushing this issue in public space. I love the sort of trickster or gorilla element to, you know, serving it on the Saddam Hussein plates and that often art can give up those ideas uh, <coughs> that are outside of, you know, the same old political action. And I think, you know, when we are, when poets participate in demonstrations during the Iraq war, and uh, as John mentioned, what this rocky wage out of DC poets against the war. And there were like a hundred, you know, hundreds and hundreds of signs that said, end the war now. <laughs> and ours said, had a quote, had quotes from poets. 
So one of them was by Yehuda Amakai, the, the Israeli poet, and the fact that the poet said, my son smells of peace when I lean over the crib. Something like that. And just the sensual experience. Of what is peace? It is the father and the child in that moment. I can't tell you how popular we were with our photographers. <laughs> <laughs> We, we've been holding protests. Uh, we had the most people on this morning down at the World Bank, which is has a tribunal inside it where corporations bring lawsuits against uh, governments for things they don't like. And we've teamed up with uh, groups of farmers in northern El Salvador who are fighting against gold mining companies coming in. And and, um, and we go down there and. We hold, we do leafleting, we hold demonstrations, but pulling Sarah and split this rocket, we had, you know, signs that said, and, you know, World Bank domination of El Salvador, the, the usual boring signs. And you brought in quotes from the Bible, among other things. No, no. <laughs> uh, change the face of that. Other thoughts people like to add in here? For Sarah, um, about, thinking about your database and the top topics, yeah. um, and I wonder if you ever have trouble putting poems in, in topical categories. I um, feel like my favorite poems. I have a hard time saying what's the top, what's the <laughs> topic here, and I'm just remembering back to my freshman year in college. I signed up for a creative writing course, and the first assignment was. Um, make a list of the topics you feel qualified to write about. <laughs> and uh, I immediately got on my 18 year old arrogant certain five words and said, This guy doesn't know anything about this. He doesn't pretty well know poets, but no one's read it. But I thought, Did Keats feel qualified to write about the vision or no? <laughs> it's an experience and it's, it's just this connection. And, and uh, so, anyway, I dropped the course. They're, they're with, you know. But uh, uh, I just wonder, you know, does it ever feel reductive? Of course, it does feel uh, reductive in the sense of, um, you know, you're taking this piece of art and you're saying this is about just this one thing. And actually, we, the, the Washington Post book critic, who um, it just can't seem to get himself to get over his his uh, kind of conservative training in literature. Um, always has to put in a little dig about, you know, it seems like um, this rock is all about turning poetry into propaganda. Um, but the, as you heard from the poems that I read, if a poem isn't a good poem, it's not going to make social change. It has to be a powerful poem, because otherwise it's boring. It just sounds like the same old and the war now speech. Um, so uh, our artistic standards are very high. And that means, of course, that sometimes a, uh, a poem isn't as obvious as to how it addresses the topic. And so we are, um, we always check the exercise with the poets, to make sure we didn't misinterpret their poem. Um, but of course, yeah. So um, it is, of course, it means that you're you're choosing to put objective aspects on it because you want to protect it all. Um, but it just me it's a it's a tool, it's an imperfect tool. Um, so that people who are doing the Black Lives Matter event can find the poem on racial racial justice or written by a black poet. Um, because the poets also choose whether to tag themselves by identity. Which you know has been a source of endless discussion. Um, what are how how do we describe ourselves um, as the very humanity that we are? So um, that it's it's a work it's a constant work in progress. And but what we hope is when you find the poem, it blooms beyond just that one definition. That you went looking for. It blooms into its fullness as a spark. Yeah. You say 
Your artistic standards are high. I think you can wonderful. But there's a difficulty in breaking the barrier between the group of people that are sitting in this room and the hundreds of people that are walking by the door down on the street who wouldn't be caught dead in this room. That barrier, to some extent, has to do with the things that are listed there, poetry, quality, playwriting. For a lot of people, those are things that, for whatever reason, they shut their mind to. How big a topic of conversation? I don't know anything about any of your groups. We don't come from this country at all. But how much discussion is there about bursting the, the, the wall that has existed for whatever reason? I was this elementary school teacher for 25 years, and simply uttering the word poetry can bring all kinds of shrieks from a lot of people. But that has changed. Uh, well, it okay. has. It has changed dramatically. And I'll ask the young people in the room to speak to it. Uh, the poets in the DC Youth Slam team are the rock stars of their high schools. They are the football quarterbacks of their high schools. Poetry speaks to young people like never before. And that's because poets are writing work that is relevant to their lives. And young people are writing poetry that is re relevant to their lives and speaking for one another. And so, um, yes, we need teachers who get it and can introduce poetry in a different way than they have in the past. And I think so. I think the wall that you're describing is less, um, is more permeable than we think it is. Because I think it's a hugely important thing. How important the ideas that are being discussed so far that they leave this room and go out on that street. I think that is extremely important. Otherwise, the changes that we're all hoping for are going to be more difficult. But I wonder, could you say just a little more then about the DC plan team in terms of where it comes from? I mean, I'm even, I realize I don't know the origin. Did people come to you? Did you go to the high schools? Did the high schools come to you? Um, the, D, the, the DC Youth Slam Team predates with this run. It existed and it, it lost its institutional home and it came to us and asked us to take it on. But Slam started in 1980 or 81 in a bar in Chicago when a construction worker poet named Mark Smith. So what? <laughs> <laughs> the spiel that happens at Slams. Um, and Kamisha is a competing Slam poet, so. Um, he, when he was like, we need to make, make find a way for poetry to be popular, so let's make it a competition and beer have beer involved. <laughs> <laughs> so it happened in, in bars a lot in those days. Um, so, it, you know, the competition is kind of random. People are chosen from the audience to judge, and you give it a number and you hold it up. But um, it's kind of a crazy way for those of us who don't come out of that tradition to to be in relationship to poetry. But it has contributed hugely to this changing um, perception of poetry in Canada. And now, um, a lot of movement back and forth between page and stage, slam and literary, such that these categories don't, you know, we're working on breaking them down and not having them exist anymore. But it's precisely poetry and, and art, I think, that can uh, reach through that wall. Um, and if you're exposed to a poem on a topic that you haven't thought about or it scares you or it's about somebody that you've been taught to fear, um, it can begin to, to reach into others, into your heart and change. I'll bring you two examples as well. One, in the theater world, there's a similar a parallel with the fringe festivals you go in Scotland. And they, you know, it costs a lot of money to go to, to play. The Fringe Festival was this opportunity to, to lower the bar, both for how much it would cost, but also for participation, so you have a lot more people participating. And now you have Fringe Festival all over the world, and now we're doing it in the same regions. And it brings in just a whole different audience. So it's great. Um, the second thing is, uh, 
and it's somewhat, it's not art, art, but it's culture, and that's sports. And I want to give an example of that with Iran. Um, when the State Department was trying to figure out what would be the most in, uh, impactful way of setting up an exchange with Iran, a person, people to people exchange, they thought, well, it should be in the sports world. And it should be wrestling. <laughs> now, why wrestling? Wrestling because Iran is better than us. So it's important in order to have a kind of respectful relationship to acknowledge that the other side actually has a talent that we don't have, that we could actually learn from Iran. Now, there was also a realization that by using wrestling and wrestling exchange, there could be, you could reach out to constituencies that wouldn't ordinarily be reached. Because in Iran, wrestling is actually favored by conservative elements. You have exchanges between countries. It's often the same people. You know, you have, a, let's say, painting exchange. You have people who are like, well, of course I believe in exchange. Of course I believe in, you know, bilateral relations. I'm a cultured person. I like paintings, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of stereotype. Wrestling, on the other hand, attracted precisely the constituency that didn't go to those kinds of events. That in Iran were very religious, very conservative, traditionally conservative. And here was an opportunity for American wrestlers to engage with those folks. And the same holds true, frankly, on the US side. Because you know, wrestling tends to be rather conservative here in the United States, it attracts rather to conservative values. And to have Iranians come to those events as opposed to like a wine and cheese event in Washington, D.C., that was revolutionary, you know? So thinking in terms of audience is so critical, rather than just the production. I have an idea. I have an idea. It's a great idea. I'm going to do it. Thinking about, well, what is the audience I want to reach? And what are they interested in? That has to be part of the problem. So it's time to close up. Yeah. So maybe some, I just want to get in last minute because we didn't get a lot of comments and questions in. So if there any burning that people want to say something before we close with that final question. we got to read the poem. Oh, I was just going to say the degree to which poetry has now been popularized. We, Beyonce just came out with this visual album and um, uses the words of a slam poet in between every single frame. Like it was very powerful and kind of everywhere. Her name is Mar Sunshine. Her name is Mar Sunshine. So let's read our poem. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, who has the book that has the, the pages? Can you start us then by reading those lines that I bracketed and then your piece, and then we'll go around the room? We need unprovided attention. Right. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so everybody take responsibility for somebody's poem that's next to you. I have the side, I have the white space. <laughs> the space between the lines. And um, thank you. Okay, hold on. Yeah, so start with Andrea's lines and then read your lines and then we'll go this way. Okay, everybody ready? We'll go this way and then back this way and then. No, no. Just, just, just your own lines from now on. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Disclaimers. <laughs> There's no right to write a poem. Right okay. And speak up because over there is a long way. I 
okay. you do the homework. <laughs> Oh, you have the hammer. Why is it over here? Oh, no. You want him to see the hundred, but watch me for him. Let me plan to a place to break the world. We smell sometimes. I didn't follow the yeast of compassion for a hurting soul that bubbles in your marrow at the first time of spring. Is there anything on that one? You're teaching a child to stand up for herself, sacrificing and cause the revolution. If you're trying to change and got to the point, you start by accelerating the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to bring light, be a beacon. If you want to bring pain, be open. Not judging. I'm reading this from now. Who can be the inner space at any end engage in doing work? <laughs> If you were wondering, wandering for me, read the history of stripping of oh, <laughs> by, by the way, he's a wrestler. Mark, <laughs> <laughs> and when you do begin to dream again, let me kiss the golden dust from your eyelids and we'll both wake up. Aww. Nice. Is that the question you're worth? Let's to the president, start mobilizing on the street. If you're worried about the country, ask, what can make us all complete? If you're watching the justice, start doing the right thing. If you think about it, start loving it. That's your one is next Tuesday um, with the National Domestic Workers Alliance and IPS, but this is a group that has organized nannies and caregivers around the country to fight for the rights that were denied them when everybody else got worker rights in the 1930s. Um, and they're right here with us with, with this rock. So thank you all. Uh,